Hello, everybody. Welcome to this. We're back with our Telescope Talk Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell. I run DeepAstronomy.Space. And it's been a while. It's been a while since we've been here talking about telescopes. Last time we were here, we were discussing the eclipse. So we were, this was back in August, the last time we did it. So September kind of came and went. But I have an excuse. I got hit by a hurricane. So there, that happened. And so I couldn't quite... Uh, couldn't quite do it uh, at the month of September, but um, got my stuff together. And my my co-hosts, whom I will bring up right now, are with me to talk about telescopes. On the top there is Adam Smith. He runs the Unseen po uh, Podcast. Um, have you started back up on that, by the way, Adam? We have, okay. yeah. Good. So check that out at Unseen. Is it Unseen.com? Unseen Podcast. Com. Ah, there it is. Okay, we got the plug in. And also down at the bottom there we is... We have... Uh... What? <laughs> it's okay. Okay. Uh, on the bottom is, is John Suffolk. He is an amateur astronomer at in the uh, wonderful United Kingdom. Both these guys are from the United Kingdom, actually. It's dark, and they're, instead of outside observing, they're here talking with us about telescopes. And today we're going to be discussing the idea of telescope accessories now we've already talked about telescopes we've told you what we think about beginner telescopes we told you a little bit about observing with the sun and now we're going to talk about okay so you've got your telescope it, you got it came with an eyepiece probably if you bought one of the ones like that we've recommended it probably came with a 40 millimeter maybe a 20 millimeter eye, or 26 millimeter eyepiece but, you know, you've taken it out, you've looked around, and you've seen what you can see, and now you want to do other things with it. And so we're going to talk about that today. What should you get? What kind of cool accessories are out there? And what should you kind of stay away from? And what's a kind of a bit of a waste of money? So today we're going to be talking about that, and uh, uh, hopefully this will help you get your um, telescope on. Now, <laughs> I've... Uh, I'm looking at some, as I do with every Hangout, I'm looking at live chat uh, stuff. I've got the YouTube one up. Galaxia's here. Hi, Galaxia. Uh, and uh, we are, I'm looking at that. I'm also on Twitch, but not as many people show up on that yet as do the YouTube one, although it is our backup one if things go wrong on YouTube. And I'm also looking at Facebook. Um, you know what I did, though? I gave up on Twitter. I don't like Twitter anymore. I, I just, I mean, okay, I'm, I am broadcasting on Periscope right now, but only because I, it's just a thing I can add to the stream. But I, I'm just getting, I don't know. Do you guys use, do you guys use Twitter or Twitter at all? No. Twitter Lite. Twitter Lite. What's that? I use it infrequently. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, I don't know. It's just like, I, there's just so many trolls on there lately and i just i don't know i've just stopped using it so much i use it to say okay we're live or i'll use it to say um you know the, this video has just been posted or whatever but that's about it um i'm getting kind of i'm getting put out with twitch or with twitter twitch is good okay um accessories so how do you want to how do you guys want to start you want to um you want to talk about what your favorites are let's start with some of the basics you got any how do you want to start john you start for us well, if you, uh, um, if you just got a, a brand new telescope, let me just set the stage for you. If you got a brand new telescope, you you just learned how to use it. It came with an eyepiece. What's the next thing you would recommend buying? Well, another thing that you get with um, refractors and um, uh, Cassegrain reflectors is um, a 90 degree diagonal. It's otherwise, um, if this, if you can imagine this, is your telescope. It's, if you go up at an angle like that, looking at something high up, uh -huh. it's not going to be laid down on the floor. So you get um, a diagonal. It sits into the bottom of it, and it brings the eyepiece to a much better um, level. Now, yeah, that's so a, that's called a star diagonal, and there's two kinds. They're, basically, it's like John says. It moves the, the light up a 90 degrees so you can see it at a better angle. But there's two different kinds. There's a prism. They have a prism in there that does the refract or basically bends the light. And they have mirrors. There's mirror yeah. ones. Which do you like better? Um, the mirror. Me too. A, um, a prism um, gives you um, the image the right way up. Right. And it's, it's 
perfect for um, looking at you know, birds and ducks and things for like earthbound stuff. But it does take out some of the light. A mirror, which is uh, what this one does, which, which is what this one has, um, it gives you an inverted image and um, it doesn't reduce the light as much. Yeah, and I have a. Th I've, I've gone to Orion's website. This is telescopes.com, and they they're just a place in the U.S. You can buy these. This, this is a good store. I'm, I have no affiliation with them. I don't even have any any links for them yet. Affiliate links. Although I should set those up. Um, here's what he's, here's a, here's a, many examples of diagonals, and as you can see, there is the mirror diagonals that we were talking about, and they come in two sizes: an inch and a quarter, and a two inch. This is just how big the diameter is uh, of the of the tube that will hold the eyepiece. Mo most reflectors or most telescopes you buy have inch and a quarter uh, size tubes. Okay, and so you know, and they're not they're not expensive. They're like forty bucks. Um, but here's a prism one. It's a little bit cheaper. Cup, you know, this one's forty bucks. This one's thirty eight. Um, and I don't know. They the the reason John, I'll, I'll tell you why I like the mirror ones and then John can tell you why he does. But for me, they, these prisms are generally pretty cheap and they have a lot of internal reflections and they degrade the image a little bit. You can also get a lot of scattering in one of these. But here in a mirror diagonal, all you all it has is a little mirror at this bottom plane here, right down here where it's flat, there's a mirror and light just goes in. Actually, it comes in here and then bounces up and goes there. And... That simple. It has, you know, the mirrors are generally high quality um, for the price, and uh, that's why I like them. Why do you like them, John? Uh, for exactly the same reason. I've, I've never actually used um, a prism um, diagonal, to be honest. Um, but don't forget the mirrors in these things are surface coated, like you get in um, a Newtonian reflector mm -hmm. and, um, on the Cassegrain, so you do not stick your finger down the inside. That is. <laughs> That You'll just get a big old fingerprint right there. <laughs> That's right. But there's, there's two types of mirror um, diagonal. Um, this is a standard one. It's cheap, about thirty pounds. Um, that'll reflect about ninety to ninety-two percent of the light, um, which is okay for most things. Um, this one. This two. Let me get. Let me get you up. I have, I have the web page on. Go ahead. Are you showing something? This, this one is um, a dielectric. Um, that just means it's um, different metals um, used in the mirror. And that will reflect 99% um, or more of the light. Right. It might not seem, seem like much, but if you're looking at the dimmer deep sky objects, buying a dielectric um, diagonal could mean a difference between seeing the object and not seeing it. You don't get anything for nothing. Um, I don't get something for nothing, rather. They are more expensive, but not um, prohibitively so. I got this one for, I think, £45. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're pretty reasonably priced, really. So here, you know, here's what we're talking about, folks. You get a, you get a telescope, this is a refractor, and you've got the, you know, if you don't have a, 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 a diagonal here, then looking through it, is very um, awkward. You've got to put your eye down here, and this just moves it up to a more comfortable area. There are, it's also important to use these on um, Schmidt Cassegrains too. Let me get one. It's going to be useful if you're. On that one. I was going to say really useful if you're looking straight up towards the zenith. Oh yes. Oh yeah. yeah. So that's another point. So here, here's a Schmidt cast, and so if you, oh, I can zoom in. Let me just. Well, maybe not. Um, but the uh, you can see that you know looking straight out the back of the tube would be a little bit awkward. And again, like like Adam says, if you're pointing straight up, like looking straight overhead, then it's uh, it's also just just saves your neck. Uh, basically, is what it does. The focus changes a little bit, but not too bad. So anyway, that's that's a good that's a good suggestion. So some telescopes come with them. Like I think if you bought this telescope, this one I'm showing, uh, it would probably come with it. Um, let me see. How can I figure out what comes with it? Uh, yeah, I think like John said, you need to be wary of the cheap ones. You can get really cheap prism ones that are not much good. You'd probably want to replace that if it came with the telescope you bought. 
Well, I don't know. I mean, I trust one that came with Celestron. If if I bought this scope, I'd probably that it'd probably come with a pretty nice mirror, <clears throat> mirror diagonal. So I'd probably use that. But um, yeah, you're right. You mm -hmm. want to you want to some telescopes are better than others, and you want to make sure you know the the most people, especially beginners, aren't going to tell the difference between a bad diagonal and a good one. It's after you get experience looking in an eyepiece that you will um, be able to tell the difference. So um, anyway, yeah, good job. Okay, so a so one eye, so spend forty bucks, get yourself a right ag, right angle uh, uh, prism or right angle uh, uh, star diagonal, and they they come in different angles. You can get a forty five degree one too, um, but those tend to be used more for spotting scopes that are used horizontally, like they're pointing somewhere far at the horizon, and it makes it slightly more comfortable to use uh, with a forty five degree prism in it or uh, diagonal. But um, <coughs> most yeah, telescopes use ninety. They, they, I think the 45 degree um, diagonals uh, give an upright image as well. It's oh, that's another point we should mention. When you look through a, a telescope with a diagonal in it, if, it if, you're, if, if you're just, first of all, if you're doing it without the diagonal in it and you just have the eyepiece in there, you're looking at a, an image that is inverted. It's turned backward. But if you put a diagonal in it, it's also flipped vertically, and it's backwards and upside down. So it has two, two because of the reflections, it's it's flipped it. So that's a good point. If you're using it for terrestrial use, which you can use these telescopes for, especially refractors, they're really good for that, uh, then you have to kind of remember they are going to flip upside down. That's a good point. And they'll be backwards. So, um, you soon get, get used to, um, <laughs> very true. We, have a, we have a quick question in the YouTube chat from Go for it. Uh, Eresis. He's asking if we recommend the old azimuth or equatorial mounts. An equatorial mount takes um, a fair bit of time to set up, you can uh, budget for about 30 minutes to set up um, the equatorial mount properly. An altazimuth uh, mount you can just take outside, plunk on the ground, and away you go. Why do you need, why do you have to, why is it so much extra time, John? Well, um, you've got to pull the line it first. Right, right. If you're going to do it properly, um, which means that the, the it's got to be smack on, basically. Um, the this telescope has got a polar mount on it, and yeah. basically, uh, this that has two axes. This axis right here, if you could see my mouse pointer, is the polar is the polar uh, axis. This is the part part you need to line up with the North Star. Now these mounts <laughs> have a little telescope built into the uh, into the axis itself. There's a little cap here. You pop that off, and you can look through the back of a little eyepiece here, and you just try to center. Polaris, the North Star, using that little telescope. I've always hated these. I've never been able to do them right. And I've, uh, if you directly center Polaris, then you're still not polar aligned because Polaris isn't exactly the North Star. So uh, I've always not liked these very much. I've used the drift method to line these up, but that's what he's talking about. This axis here is the declination axis, which you don't have to polar align, but this you do right here. And I wish they would put um, a 90-degree 90 90 diagonal on the end of that little telescope. I know, because you, you, you're down here on the ground. <laughs> sitting... It's a pin in the ass. <laughs> That's right. You're sitting on your butt or knee or whatever it is, trying to look through this thing, craning your neck up. It's I, it's much better to just align it using the polar the drift method. That's what I do. Um, but anyway, that's – and so, yeah, so, John, I agree with you on that. However, there are advantages – to using a polar mount. And we talked about yep. that on the earlier episodes when we talked about Dobsonian mounts and things like that. Altazimus mounts rotate the field of view uh, as as the sky progresses. Um, even if you perfectly track the star, over, over the night, the, the object, whatever it is, is going to rotate in the field of view. And if you're doing imaging, that's a problem. But um, most yeah, of the time it's not. It would be a killer for imaging. Yeah. Uh, so yes, I guess Al I like alt azimuth mounts for ease of use as well. Um, lo the 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 Schmidt Cassegrains, the the C8s and stuff of the world, 
come with something called an equatorial wedge. So you can buy that and it doesn't come with it. You got to buy it extra. That's like $200, which brings me to another accessory. If you have a Schmidt Cassegrain telescope with a, let me look up Celestron 8 here. Celestron 8. And uh, the fork, they don't have the fork mounts anymore. Where are the fork mounted ones? I'm just looking at um, fork mount. Wow, really? Do they not sell them anymore? They must call them something else. Surely they have a fork mount. Ah, here we go. Here's a fork mount. Okay, boy, they've changed. Okay, this is an 11 inch. Let me just pull this up. Um, and so I've been. <laughs> so here we go. Here's here's an 11 inch C11. Really nice telescope. Uh, do not buy this for your first one uh, unless you happen to be Bill Gates. Um, but <laughs> you know this is uh, this is a wonderful telescope. But you'll notice it's sitting flat on the. Are you kidding me? Um, it's sitting flat oops. on the. Oops, are you looking at my email? <laughs> uh, it's sitting flat on the, <laughs> on the tripod, and uh, the. This will this will rotate in this direction, the uh, azimuth direction, and then of course the altitude direction is up here on this axis. There's a wedge you can buy that will make this a polar mount or a polar aligned mount, with, by, because the forks will become your polar uh, axis. Let me just say the wedge. Let me see wedge. Wedge. Let me just see. Oh, they don't sell the wedges. Oh, great. Okay. Well. Um, you know, I'm starting to think I'm pretty old school now. Yeah. They really not sell wedges no more. That's like, what? No, I'm sure they do. They, oh, oh, Home, Home Muffin is already saying they don't sell wedges much yeah. anymore. They use beefy equ equatorial mounts and bigger uh, AP dedicated oh. schmidt cassegrain telescopes. Yeah, I guess so. Boy. Anyway, all right, so forget that. That's a crappy accessory. I, it would be an accessory if you had a fork-mounted schmidt cassegrain telescope and you wanted to have it polar aligned. But um, they tended to be expensive. For my mead, um, 12, my, for my 10-inch mead, I, it cost me like $400 just for the wedge. So it's pretty, uh, it's pretty uh, expensive. Okay, I want to tell you about. I want to talk about Barlow's before we get too much. We're twenty minutes in. I want to talk about Barlow's a little bit. Barlow's are these accessories that I think you need to have if you um, if you uh, want to view the planets. I think every telescope needs one. Maybe John, I think you disagree with this a little bit, but a Barlow a Barlow lens is one of these things. Here's here's what they look like. Uh, they just fit into the Tell the eyepiece tube, and then you put the eyepiece on the after that. Here, I like this one, this shorty one here, because it's not so long. But they come in two flavors, 2X and 3X. And I get the 2X. So, like, here, you know, this is like 40 bucks. This one's a little bit better probably because it's Teleview. And if you got the money, buy it because Teleview stuff is awesome. But um, this is a 3X Barlow here. Um, and they also come an inch and a quarter and two inches, just like all the other accessories for eyepieces. And what this does is this has the effect. Here's my little uh, uh, Wikipedia page on this. A Barlow lens is this thing right here called B. It's this. It's this. It's this right here. Make sure I'm still broadcasting. Yes, I am. Um, and this is the Barlow here, and you can see two lines. There's the red line and there's the green line. If you did not have a Barlow lens, if you did not have B here, then the eyepiece would focus to a point where this red, these red lines go. But because you've added this double concave uh, lens, it extends your focal length, making it, in, in, if you've got a 2X Barlow, then you have twice the focal length effectively that you had before. So if your telescope was 2,000 millimeters, now it's 4,000 millimeter focal length. So that's what a Barlow does. And if it's three times, you multiply your telescope focal length by 3x. And it has the effect in one shot of doubling or tripling your magnification uh, right away. And that's important. And that's important in when you're looking at the planets because remember, remember before we talked about magnification and field of view? 
field of view is how much of the sky you can see in the eyepiece and at lower magnifications you can see more of the sky and that's important for things like the Andromeda Galaxy or or uh, the Orion Nebula, things like that. But for planets, you don't need that field of view because they're pretty small, but you do want magnification. And, uh, and I think it's an important, an important um, accessory. What do you guys think? Yeah, really important. If you want to see Jupiter or Saturn, any of the outer solar system <coughs> planets in any detail, you, you're going to need a Barlow lens because honestly, I mean, like Jupiter or, or Saturn will appear really small in your telescope field of view. So you need to make it three times bigger. It's the uh, ideal solution. I yeah. don't like them. You don't I've like got, them, John? I've got, I've got some Barlow um, um, lenses, and I do use them sometimes. They're useful for, for finding out if your telescope can take um, a certain... Um, eyepiece magnification. Like, can it can it take um, a three millimeter eyepiece or a four millimeter eyepiece? After you found out that it does, or that it can, buy the eyepiece. It'll give you a much better image. So you're and saying don't... okay, and and I guess in in the days before some of these eyepiece designs came out, I would agree with you that, or, or I would I would say you know. Um, I would say don't do that, but because these new eyepiece designs have come out, you make a good point. So what he's saying is if you want the double magnification, then get a good quality short focal length eyepiece, like a four millimeter, six millimeter. Yeah. I had a seven millimeter Nagler that I used. A Nagler is a design. It's an eyepiece design. It was like a, I don't know, it was a few hundred dollars though. And uh, it was it gave superb images with a wide field of view, and I loved it. I used it all the time for the planet. So John's right. I mean, yeah, if you if you can afford the extra eyepieces in that range, especially the Naglers, then go ahead and get them. But um, I don't know. This is a you know forty bucks. It's hard to beat that. So it's good to have one in your case, uh, just in case. I've used them all the time. Let me. I I have. So here's Stellarium. Okay, now this I was working on my the next video, your sky tonight video, and I and I was playing around with this. Uh, here's the sky tonight from where am I? I think I'm in I think I'm in South Carolina. Let me look and see. Uh, yeah, I'm in South Carolina right now, and here's the sky tonight at about uh, nine fifteen um, local time. That's about uh, let's see ten eleven twelve one about two o'clock you guys' time. Um, but here here's what's up. Uh, we got the moon. It's really bright right now. In fact, it's uh, it's almost full, so that's huge. Um, but we also have it's going to get in the way. But tonight we also have Saturn, and I love looking at Saturn. Now, this is what Stellarium says Saturn looks like in a C8 telescope with a 26 millimeter eyepiece. I actually disagree with this. I think that this is selling Saturn quite a bit short. I think it looks much better than this, but I'm gonna. I want to. I want to show you what the effect of adding an, a Barlow lens does. So here's Saturn, C8, 26 millimeter eyepiece. You put in a 2x Barlow. Do you guys see the difference? There it is without, and there it is with it. Now you can begin to see the rings of Saturn here. You can also see some of the other moons of of, of Saturn itself. If you put a 3x Barlow in, now you can really see the rings, okay? The field of view has gotten smaller. You can see here, like, 3x, 2x, no x. Uh, you can see the difference in field of view. But magnification has gone up. This is in a C8 telescope. This is an 8-inch Schmidt Cassegrain. Now, to be fair, this is how I think Saturn looks in a C8 with no Barlow. I've seen these rings quite prominently without any Barlow at all. So I question Stellarium's um, depiction here a little bit. This is an, this is an outstanding program, but, but the in this case, I think Saturn looks more like this without a Barlow. But anyway, this is what you get with Barlows. Now, John says, just buy yourself a really nice eyepiece. I don't think I can go down to 40 or to 4 millimeters. I can't. Um, but... Um, this you know that would give you the equivalent magnification without the Barlow, and the optics are probably better in that eyepiece, and you'll get a better image. So, um, 
that's that might be a good idea, a good a good way to go. So that's what a barlow does for you if you um, if you if you buy one of them. So that's that is I think an accessory everybody should have. Well, I've seen them at, um, five times by those advertised. And really? even I don't like them. Yeah, that, that's going a bit too far, I think. <laughs> um, and I, yesterday at the um, Astronomy Club, I almost bought um, a two and a half times um, two inch Barlow. So I do use them. I just don't like using them. If, yeah. I, if, I, can, if I can help it, then I'll, you know, I'll not use one. Okay, what anybody want to take on Russell up some grab grubs <laughs> comment or question there? You want me to read it? Are expensive oculars worth the investment on a ninety millimeter Mac? Maxitoff. Yeah. Oh, Maxitoff. Sorry. Or do um, moderate oculars work as well? This is a a ninety millimeter um, Maxitoff Cassegrain. Um, what do you guys think? Um, I'd go for a moderate price. What's that? I'd go for a moderately priced um, Oculus. I think you can never. If you've got the money, sometimes the the you buy you spend money on an eyepiece. It's always money well spent, especially a well made one, because you can use it in so many different situations and telescopes. You may have your ninety millimeter now, but you may end up with something bigger later, and that that same eyepiece would work. Just choose your eyepieces right, and I think um, the Teleview eyepieces are about the best you can get. Let me let me this, since that is an accessory. Let's go look at uh, Teleview. Eyepieces. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so here, yeah, there. Let me just put this up. These can be quite pricey. Uh, Televues. Uh, Televue is a company that's run by a guy named Ralph Nagler, and uh, he make they they make some of the best designs and telescope or the best eyepieces you're ever going to buy. But they are not cheap. Look at this. Um, here's one for five hundred dollars, a forty-one <laughs> millimeter panoptic telescope. These are awesome. These these are my favorite. These these plossels. Um, I like these a lot. Um, here's a fifteen millimeter for nine ninety-five dollars. That's not so bad. But um, this here's an here's an eight millimeter plossel that's really good. Um, these Naglers. Oh my God! Look look how funky they look. But they these things. <laughs> are like many telescopes themselves they have so many uh optical elements in them um here's a six millimeter i don't even i've never delos eyepiece that one i've never used but it seems to be more or less reasonably priced um so these are top of the line you won't go wrong buying one of these eyepieces ever in the, your life but if don't buy them if you're not serious about going out and doing visual observing astronomy they're really only good for that you're not going to be able to use them much in imaging, um, but they are uh, they are beautiful to look through. Um, absolutely amazing, um, but they are the top of the line and tend to be pretty <coughs> pretty pricey. But if I just type in Plusel, what comes up? Televues, of course. Orion makes some really good Plusels. Okay, I wouldn't I wouldn't say no to any of these. What do you guys have? You guys tried these? I, um, I think I've got some uh, Orion eyepieces. Yeah, they're very affordable. I mean, here you go, twenty millimeter eyepiece for one hundred ten dollars. Um, you know, these are all third. I don't know if I'd go down to well, some of these maybe a six millimeter would be about as far down as I'd go. Uh, but these forty millimeters are very nice. Although your telescope probably came with one. Um, that's that's Teleview again. Let's well, Skywatch is come with um, a ten and a twenty five. Oh, do they? Okay, and for, so a forty millimeter might be good if you need a real wide view, uh, wide field view of, say, the Orion Nebula uh, or the Andromeda Galaxy. Then, then you'd want to do that. Um, so yeah, I mean, oh, these plossels are great. Mead plossels are really good. They come, they generally come with Mead telescopes when you buy them, a twenty-six millimeter or something like that. But these are all outstanding plossels, I think. They're all made in Japan by the same manufacturer. So whether you're buying a Mead or a Celestron, uh, 
telescope, you're probably getting eyepieces from the same manufacturer. And if, in fact, if you look at yeah. them, the only real difference is the color of the lettering um, that is embedded in the machining. So um, they typically are the same Japanese manufacturer that does it. Well, to put turn puzzles into a bit of perspective, back in the 1970s, if you was going to buy um, a, a an eyepiece, a puzzle was probably um, beyond your budget. And you'd have to get uh, something like a Huygens or something cheap and nasty. Um, but <laughs> nowadays, with um, uh, computer-aided design, computer-aided manufacture, um, and the benefits of scale, the economies of scale, the more you sell, the cheaper each unit becomes. Um, plus, was a shot down in price incredibly. Yeah. So yeah. Nowadays, everybody can buy one. Yep. So, and I think they're a revolutionary design. Now, Alexander Rainders just created, uh, corrected me and said they're all manufactured at uh, Syntha in, in China. Um, okay. Uh, uh, they used to be in Japan, but uh, I'll give you that. It's probably now in China. But my point is, you're buying roughly from the same manufacturer, and they're, rel they're relatively good quality, I think. Padme, I wish I could turn on closed captioning, but I don't have that kind of money. I can't afford to have somebody typing in our conversation live while we're <laughs> while we're broadcasting. I'm really sorry. So, uh, but thanks for doing it. I, I hopefully the the YouTube algorithm will give you a reasonable facsimile of this after it's all over. But I'm afraid I can't afford to pay. Uh, for a closed captioning type person. If you would like to see closed captioning on the Telescope Talk Hangout, please consider becoming a Patreon patron for Deep Astronomy. I will use that money to get closed captioning for you guys. Uh, let's see. Home of and cheap, wide field, free from aberrations and all kinds of scopes. Pick two. Cheap, wide field, and free from aberrations. Pick two. Do you guys agree with that? Um, cheap, wide field, free from aberrations. You can't get all three. I think you can, as long as um, you don't go too cheap. It's um, cheap and nasty and cheap and adequate. Cheerful. Yeah. yeah. I would have said cheerful. that you can't get all three in the seventies and eighties, but now I think you can. I mean, I've seen with Orion telescopes the the under five hundred have good wide field characteristics, and they're relatively free of aberrations. I mean, um, you're going to get them in, in even Takahashi's and some of the high-end telescopes, but you always get aberrations, But um, even in the expensive ones. But it's whether you can live with them or not. And I think it's got we've gotten close. We're, in, the, in the way that we're in the golden age of astronomy for the professionals, I think in the amateur world we're also in the golden age because of materials uh, being and manufacturing processes being so uh, refined. How much does closed captioning cost? I think it's a dollar a minute, but I'm not sure. So if you're looking at an hour, that's 60 bucks per, but I do several hangouts a week. And uh, again, you know, like I said, not quite there yet. Um, and so uh, I will, let's see. Um, a lot depends on the scope, I think. At F4, things get rough. Yeah, well, well with what? I mean, F4 refractors maybe but not reflectors i've seen some really good f4 newtonians for example f4 and a half at least um do you agree with that guys um well mine's an f5 and that's clear um you know, pinch up all the way through yeah the kind yeah, of aberrations you're going to see are going to be uh coma on the edges of corrector plates for things that have corrector plates spherical aberration on newtonians where they didn't quite get the figure of the mirror down well enough. Uh, and these all appear on the edge of the field of views as little streaks in the stars. Um, uh, if, you, if you've got a refractor, then you get this thing called chromatic aberration, but that has been really reduced with a lot of these apochromats that are out there. So they are really reduced uh, a lot of the uh, and the coatings that are out there. And the way that looks is you see little tiny rainbows at the edge of the field of view where the lens is not doing a good job. Of uh, well, focusing. on my um, refractor, the one I use most, um, it's only a, a single, there's no um, extra um, lens in there to reduce the massive aberration. But it's um, almost perfect. Even on something like Jupiter, yeah, um, a really bright thing with the um, the, the you know, get blue at one side and like orange at the other side. Yeah, um, 
you can barely notice that. Okay, so that is that is another accessory we were just talking about. We talked about Barlow's. Now I want to talk about the opposite of that, which is called a telecompressor. And what those do is the opposite of what a Barlow does. They reduce your focal length by some amount. And they generally, and again, you buy them according to how much they reduce your focal length. They might be 0.8, which means that it would reduce your... Um, it would reduce your focal length by about 20% or so. And what that's good for is it gives you an extra wide field of view. And those tend to be used in very long focal length telescopes like a Celestron Schmidt Cassegrain, which has a 2000 millimeter focal length and reducing it to a little bit so that if you want to put a camera on it, you can match the pixel scale of the camera with the, with the focal length of your of your telescope now i know that's a lot of crap right now don't listen to that it just it just know that it helps you get better images from your uh camera and you really don't need one but it is the opposite of a for visually anyway i don't find them very useful um do you guys do you ever use a telecompressor when you're just using an eyepiece um no yeah, no. I have with cameras because you want to, you want to, you want, they, they already look at such a tiny square of the sky that you need a, a wide, a wide focal length to help match up the, uh, the, 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 the two focal lengths to get some better images. But, but with, um, but with just, you know, with, with just uh, visually looking through an eyepiece, you don't need that. But that, I just wanted to mention it because it's the opposite of a Barlow lens and they reduce it. Okay, so uh, what did I see before? I saw Ho Muffin. That is a <laughs> really crazy handle, by the way. Uh, oh, here it is. Oh, reminds me. If you have a reflector, get something to collimate. What do you guys think of that? Yes. Um, Tell now, us what collimating people, is, by the way. Collimating is basically getting the mirrors inside the Newtonian reflector perfectly aligned so that the light is coming straight out of the eyepiece at you and not off to one side right, now because you got to adjust them you got to adjust them they get you know years of sitting in a in a tube they get out of alignment don't they or even just moving it mm -hmm. yep. moving it around the, you, um, oh go ahead oh, 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 carry on i just wanted to ask you how can you tell if your telescope needs alignment if it's out of collimation right, if it right when you focus it um eventually you're going to get a little point of um, light that's the star if it goes from um, a blurred image like that and turn into a blurred image like that then it's out of collimation so you go through the focusing mechanism yeah. you turn the knob it's out of focus out of focus out of focus in focus and you keep going out of focus out of focus out of yeah. focus the other way you pass through the focus and you'll see this go from like this to this right yeah and you will never you will not be able to get it into um, you'll never get a book. dot you'll never get a perfect be, uh, bright will be like that right so you star. would do this on a bright star like vega or uh, arcturus or just some yeah. bright star and take a look if it's, it looks like a squashed hamburger and you can't get it to not be a squashed hamburger then you probably need to align your mirrors yeah but when it's um, perfectly aligned well, when all the mirrors are perfectly aligned, you should get same um, concentric circles around um, an out of the star. Oh God, I have not seen that ever, and you know why? Because that would be a nice night. <laughs> that would be a really yeah. dark, still night. What you're talking about is diffraction limited seeing. Yeah. Have you ever used um, a collimating mask? Uh, I think it's called a Bartinov mask. A Bartinov mask. Yeah. Uh, that's not for collimation. That's for focusing. All ah, right. So that's where you have. Well, tell us what that is, so we know what that is. I I actually um, had one, but the dog decided to it decided it was one of his toys and chewed it. Oh. Let's get another <laughs> one. But it's, it's mainly used for um, um, photography. You put it over your um, over the end of your telescope. A big big man, a big mask like that. It's got a maybe a piece of cardboard or a thick piece of paper or something like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. You can get, um, there's a program that will um, design a, a bad enough mask for you, and you just cut out the um, bits that you don't need. But there's um, like bars going, or gaps going that way, and then uh, I think it's um, straight ones at the bottom. Now what that does, this star in the centre, 
there's two um, two peaks coming up and the third one in the centre. So it's like that. And repeat They're like it. diffraction spikes. Diffraction spikes, yeah. Yeah. If it's, if it's off to one side, then it's um, out of focus. If it's on the other side, it's out of focus. When it's bang in the centre, then the focus is correct. Okay. All right. That's a little different than what I was thinking. I was What I used to do was I'd get a piece of cardboard that's the diameter of my tube, and I'd, I'd cut three holes in it. And then I would when it's out of focus, you see three images. And when it's in focus, all three images, there's only one image. And that's how you know you're in focus. But it really only works on bright objects like planets and, and bright stars. Yeah. But that's how you, never, one way you can get focus. I've never seen one of them. Yeah, it's just you, just, you just cut three three holes in your telescope and when it's out of focus you see three different images but when it's in focus you see one um, you don't you don't actually cut the holes in your telescope no no i don't do that i just cut them in like a file <laughs> folder or something like that and tape it on top yeah it was very uh, very quick and dirty but it re really did a good job in in doing the focus um and another can you get collimating eye sorry can you get collimating eyepieces yes um you need two. Um, there's a collimating cap, which you use to um, um, check and collimate the secondary mirror. That's a small one up, near, up underneath the eyepiece. And there's a Cheshire um, eyepiece, which you use for collimating the primary mirror. You always check the secondary mirror first before doing the um, primary mirror. You can get a laser collimator. They're expensive. And unless you get really expensive, they need collimating before you can <laughs> use them. Um, okay, Jane. Okay, let's get. Oh, did you finish? I'm sorry. Well, I was reading. well you'd be better off for getting a collimating cap and um, a Cheshire eyepiece and then into the, uh, using those. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people are scared of collimation. It sounds like a scary word, but put pe puts a lot of people off. Well, well, it's because you can screw it up. I mean, I've done it. I've had I've had my the first time I collimated a C eight. I ruined it. It was just like, oh my god! You, you know how you get those little those little Allen wrenches, and you you have to mess with the secondary and get it all lined up perfect. It took me forever to get that right, and uh, it, it, it would just it just irritated me. Um, well, so I, I, I screwed tried, it up. Um, I haven't started collimating um, a Cassegrain yet, but on my Newtonian, the first time I tried it. It took me about two hours. Yeah, yeah, and that's a pretty simple <laughs> telescope. So yeah, yeah. Uh, nowadays, um, it took me about ten minutes. Yeah, uh, but it is it is something. It is a skill you need to learn. So uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. A couple. Let me read. I'm reading some comments here. James Waddell. What's the best starter scope? You need to watch the first hangout we did. Uh, we talked about that a lot. Don't spend. But the but the punchline. Don't spend more than five hundred. I say five hundred dollars whatever that is in pounds, 500 and, or 380 or something. Uh, and make it simple. Make sure you, it's a simple, 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 simple telescope. You need to be able to look at it and know how to use it. Uh, that's what we recommend. And, and, and of course, to me, the best buy and best value for aperture is uh, uh, Dobsonian mounted telescopes. So that's, that's what we recommended um, a lot. Um, what do you guys feel about, this is from Kyle Vermast, what do you guys feel about buying used telescopes? Um, <clears throat> nothing wrong with that. Um, most of mine have been used. Just make sure you can check them out first. Yeah. Adam? I'd agree. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Telescopes are one of those things, if you buy a good one, halfway decent built, it'll last you a lifetime. They don't wear out. They don't have, they don't have motor. Well, they have clock drives. They can go weird on you. But most telescopes I've ever seen, uh, last a lifetime, and uh, that includes go-to scopes with computers and everything else. The only thing that changes is the bells and whistles. So yeah, uh, it's not like the optics are going to degrade. It's not like uh, uh, the thing's going to wear out. You know, the the optical components are going to wear out. All they do is reflect light. Now I will say that for really old Newtonian telescopes, say built like a Cave Astrola or something built in the '60s and '70s, you might want to re illuminize uh, uh, the mirrors that put a different a new coating on the mirror because over time they oxidize and they get they get uh, less reflective but um, you know that would be it really how do you guys say aluminize aluminium Al no no that's how you say aluminum 
But how do you say illuminize? It's a verb. Silvered. Silvered. Oh, okay. See this American UK thing. We're we're still working it out. So yeah, uh, yeah, definitely buy you scopes. Uh, stay away from a few brands. Uh, it used to be Tes- uh, Tesco's were pretty bad. Not Tesco. That's a grocery store. Um, <laughs> but uh, tasco tascos uh are usually not the best um yeah don't but, buy from a supermarket yeah but things like celestron anything by celestron and meat even their cheap stuff is really good um and orion a good brand um any other brands i'm thinking of you guys um, oh, sky watcher sky um, watchers yeah. good no one you can get you can buy some good telescopes nowadays in a supermarket, but no one in that supermarket is able to do anything about the telescope, its specifications, how to set it up. You really need to go to a, a telescope dealer for that. Right. But if you did buy a, a, a telescope, but halfway decent one from a department store or a grocery store, then, you know, you got us. We'll help you. Um, okay. Sure. If you have a reflector, get something to call me. We already talked about that. I love oh, deep sky dude. Uh, I love my Edmund or my Explore Scientific ED 102. It has a super clean optics with only a little edge coma. Cropping away does with that. So an ED 102. That sounds like a refractor, but correct me if I'm wrong. I have not seen that one. Um, uh, so yeah, they're commenting. Alexander Rangers wants you to get the biggest you can afford, and you don't have to buy new. That's good advice. That's very true. Um, let's see. Uh, that Tony SCT or Alexander Rangers collimation in star only. Uh, I couldn't see a single star in my C11. <laughs> really? Um, buy Chinese. He's saying this is Alexander Rangers again. Um, yeah, I guess you know it. it they it used to be they were. They weren't that good, but now I, they, it's good quality for the most part, especially the eyepieces. I honestly haven't seen a telescope in a retail store in forever. That's true. Home Muffin said that. I haven't either. Um, but um, I, just, yeah, I don't think anybody's really even thinking telescope. In the United States, anything science-related is probably not going to be a big seller. Um, so, yeah, okay. Uh, let's see. I want to take a few minutes. We have about 10 minutes left. Do you guys have any final recommendations for accessories that just really they must have? People must have. Go ahead, Adam. My absolute number one tip, and I'm not being trite or funny, my best accessory. <laughs> Whenever a bit says that, they're trying to be funny. <laughs> no. My best piece of kit for sky watching is a woolly hat and <sighs> A thin pair of woolly gloves. That's my, my right. number one. Yeah. It's want... getting colder here in the UK. It's only going to get colder for the next six months or so. Yes. Fur-lined boots. Fur-lined boots. And that that's good advice for a lot of reasons. We were talking about this before the hangout. And if you think about what you're doing out in the night sky, whether it's the fall skies or the winter skies or even the early spring skies, you're outside in temperatures that are around zero Celsius up to maybe 20, 25 Celsius if you're lucky. Uh, and even at those higher temps, um, you get, you're not moving. You're just standing there in front of an eyepiece staring. You're moving your telescope around a little bit or maybe you're pushing some buttons, but you're not really working up a sweat. So you get cold much easier and at higher temperatures than you'd think. So you want to stay comfortable. Uh, you want to have a really nice warm hat and gloves, especially the kind of gloves, if you can, that let you manipulate knobs and stuff yeah. without having to get your fingers out. I have worn hats and gloves in July in <laughs> Colorado. I mean, I mean, it, it, not here in Florida, but in Colorado. Uh, so you definitely want, that's a good advice. You definitely want to have that. Also, a red flashlight. Red flashlights are indispensable uh, because you don't want to ruin your night vision while you're out there. And so red flashlight will let you keep your night vision um, uh, as well. So you want to get a good red flashlight. But other than that, you don't need a lot to enjoy the night sky. Um, and it doesn't have to cost very much. Now, if you do things like imaging, which we'll get to in future, in future hangouts, um, then, yeah, you're going to be spending some money. And it's going to be a big deal. And it's going to be a r- right big 
endeavor to get outside every night. But uh, we want to keep this easy for you. We want you to go out on a clear, dark night and look up and enjoy what's up there. And your eyes are going to need a little bit of help. And the way you do that is you get a bigger telescope mirror to gather more light so you can see things. And as I as we close out this hangout, I want to go and I want to take a minute and I was I'm doing a Your Sky Tonight video right now and it's going to be about the Andromeda Galaxy, but I thought this would be a good way to leave this hangout by showing you a good technique. This is how I find one of the most beautiful objects in the night sky, the Andromeda Galaxy. It's the fall skies are one of the best times to view it and it's very high in the sky. Right now I have Stellarium set for tonight at about, uh, it's almost 10 o'clock, so about 9.45. Uh, this is from the, um, I have this set for South Carolina in the United States, uh, which is a pretty good latitude. It's a little bit high up, uh, but you can see this uh, in the southern latitudes as well. Now, I don't know how you guys find the Andromeda Galaxy, but it's very, if you're in a clear, dark night, then you can actually see it with your naked eye. It's a fuzzy patch up near the constellation of Cassiopeia. And the way I find it is I look for Cassiopeia. Follow Cassiopeia, yeah. And here it is. Ooh. It's right now this time of year. It's a sideways M or a W, depending on how you tilt your head. But these top stars, these top three stars, make kind of an arrowhead. And what I do is I follow that arrow over towards these brighter stars here. And eventually, and, I, and if you kind of look askance a little bit with your eye, don't look directly at it because your peripheral vision is actually better at seeing faint objects than your center vision because of the way the rods and cones in your eye work. The, per, the outside of your eye can see, or the outside of your retina can see uh, dim things in grayscale much much easier and you might see you might begin to see a smudge in the night sky if you have a pair of binoculars this becomes trivial but the way i do it is i look for the cassiopeia and i look for these top three stars and they make kind of an arrow that points directly toward the andromeda galaxy how do you guys find it yeah i do the same yes. i always I always think of a strong, uh, the constellation Andromeda as a line. Yeah. It doesn't look like... Just Andromeda is a constellation is hard to find anyway. Makeup. Like, there's the Great Square of Pegasus, which I guess it you, is. Could, you could find that, yeah. but... Yeah, Andromeda yeah, is a constellation. A lot easier to find. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that... Yeah, so, Cassiopeia like, is very just distinct. just a line. Yeah. I find it from um, Pegasus itself. Uh, you use Pegasus? What do you do? Yeah. Well, the um, the bottom left hand star, as you're looking at it, at the Great Square, yeah, uh -huh. and that's that's that star is both in Pegasus and it's also in um, Andromeda. That's right. Here's the yeah. constellation Andromeda. Here's Pegasus. So, um, follow the follow the um, line down two stars. Here. Yeah, and so that one, uh -huh. then up two stars. And there. that's how you do it. Yeah, it's just next door to the um, second star. Yep. That's a good way to do it. Although these stars would be hard to see if you're living in a light pollution, light polluted area. But yeah, so you start here you at the Great Square, Alpha Yes. Yeah. Go down two stars and over two stars. Okay. Mm. So I, it can be confusing with with the the faint stars around Andromeda. Using it, it's fine using a telescope, but with the naked eye or with uh, just with binoculars, it can be difficult to identify exactly which one which most smudges is andromeda you need good seeing yeah and it's just practice really I, I i know where andromeda is now i can go outside find andromeda the constellation and i just know where it right. will be yeah once, it once takes you experience. It's much easier the next time yep yeah yeah and uh yeah and like it like you know like adam said a good pair of binoculars will help you a lot more i've you need to see it with your naked eye anymore you need a really clear dark 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 sky and nobody has those anymore i mean 
I haven't seen a dark sky since the power went out during the hurricane. That was amazing. For the first time, I was able to see from my, my house here in Central Florida the Milky Way <coughs> galaxy, and I haven't seen that since I left Colorado and went up into the mountains. Um, wow. This You the, should have more you have hurricanes more often. It was right? gorgeous. I'm telling you. I went outside and it was silent, right? Well, that's not true because some people had generators on. But but it was just amazing how dark the sky was. And, of course, all of Florida was, was without power for a while. And it was really stunning. I just was so happy. I spent all night. I didn't have a telescope, binoculars. All I did was took out a chair and sat outside and looked, and looked up at the sky because I knew I wasn't going to get this view. Uh, for very much longer, and so, but yeah, all of this stuff was easily seen. The Andromeda Galaxy, I could see with my naked eye. Saw the Milky Way, uh, all kinds of things. So there you oh, go, folks. There's oh, you know, but, um, Andromeda Galaxy. All we all we're actually seeing is a sensor bit, the really bright bit in the sensor. If you could see all of the Andromeda Galaxy, it'd be about six moon diameters in in length. That's right. It's enormous. It's really big, and I'm. This is, of course, using imagery from other professional telescopes. But yeah, it spans way over, uh, you know, almost a hand's width in in, in size across the uh, across the sky. So yeah, it's uh, it's a good point. But really, all you're seeing is this bright smudge, this bright central part of the galaxy itself. And we're going to hit it. Hmm. You know. Few million years time, they're going to collide with it. Oh, that's right. We're, it's also heading right at us, but that's a different story. It's heading right for the United or not Marvel. United States. <laughs> it's heading right for the United States. Uh, it, no, it's, heading, <laughs> it's heading for the planet. <laughs> Although I wouldn't be surprised if it targeted the United States. It would be like, <laughs> you know what? I can't stand those guys. Um, it goes. Uh, so Galaxia, I wish I'm so jealous. I wish I could see the heavens. All right, me too. Um, I, I figure it's a it's a I don't know what are things like in the UK light pollution wise. Uh, you live in near near the you live near Hull right, uh, John? And I think you're not yeah, so I'm, far away, Adam. I'm um, right on the outskirts, outskirts of Hull, um, inside the um, boundary. Um, seeing isn't all that good. I can actually see the uh, Milky Way vaguely. Really, oh, and, that's, um, that's better than me. And the um, Andromeda Galaxy with a naked eye, um, I can just make out. But um, can you see the Orion Nebula uh, in the winter? Oh yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I can barely see that where I'm at now. So that tells you some idea. How about you, Adam? What are what are things like where you are? Pretty dreadful. Yeah, not great. I live in a similar urban environment to uh, to you two, and John's. City of Hull actually spoils my view of the northern sky. There's a big glow coming what, from Hull. make a sign with the with the old fingers. Yeah, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah it's a real crime. So I mean, right. it used to be. There are some places in the United States that try, some cities that try to be night sky friendly, but those generally have university towns. And in the case, the the, the best example I've ever seen of it was Alamogordo, New Mexico, which has. Sac Peak Observatory and Apache Point Observatory, not too close by, and they spent a lot of money on sodium vapor lamps and full cut off light fixtures that point straight down to the ground, and the none of the light shines up toward the sky, and it's actually uh, very it, it protects the night sky quite well. There's none of those dealerships that the car dealerships that have lights going straight up into the sky or or street lamps that have a lot of light linking out to the side either. And it really requires a lot of effort on the part of municipalities to do it. But the International Dark Sky Association, they, they try to help and, and give yeah. people... Take Back Space TV is saying in the chat that light pollution filters can do wonders. And they can. Let, well, okay, um, before we close out, let's leave with that. Because that's an accessory. And yeah. do you guys want to talk about that at all? Do you guys have any, for example? Uh, yes, I've got a light pollution filter. It works brilliant with the um, is it the sodium lights, the yellow ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But now, um, in the UK at least, the um, councils are changing to the LED lights, which is a white light. Yep. And you're not going to be able to filter that out. Yeah, that's a lot. It does, it does make viewing a lot better, unless you stood right underneath one, of course. Um, what makes could, what makes it better, the the filter? 
Well, it, it, it shines down more. The um, the light shine down more as opposed to. Oh, you're talking about LED light fixtures. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and that's really and, the trick. You want light to be where you want it, and not where you don't. Yeah. You don't need these light fixtures that shine up into space that do nobody any good. Nobody sees that light. You need the light pointing down, and it needs to be a full cutoff fixture. So you're saying that while LEDs are harder to filter. Yeah, impossible to filter. They, okay, impossible to filter. Then they, but they are better at being night sky friendly because of their the design yeah. of their, of their of their fixture. Yeah, well, okay, um, that's true. So for a while, at least, until everybody switches over into LED lights, you're gonna you can filter out that stuff. Um, I used to call them nebula filters, or sometimes they're called oxygen filters, O2 filters, but they basically they can filter out the lines of sodium for example they can't really do that and they do somewhat on mercury vapor lamps they can do well yeah but, you get mercury vapor ones as well yeah right and those can be filtered entirely so the effect that has in your eyepiece is they basically they're a little round the little round piece of glass that screws into the inside of your eyepiece you put the eyepiece in the eyepiece focuser you look through it and the, the sky glow that you would ordinarily see around, say, the Andromeda galaxy would be gone. It would be darker there. And you see more detail in the Andromeda galaxy than you would see if you did not have that filter in it. And that's the effect they have. And they're a good accessory. They don't cost that much. I'm only, I wonder what they... Let me, let, me, let me do a quick search here before we go. Uh, um, I think my um, light pollution filter only costs about a tenner, maybe 15 pounds. Yeah, they're not they're not that expensive. And Orion <coughs> shows filter. Oh, here we go. Um, all right, let me just let me just pull this up real quick. So, um, so here here are some some. Uh, there's a moon filter, sky glow filter. Uh, this is what we're talking about. Um, they say it's for astrophotography, but you can use it for visual use too. This one they're kind of pricey. These are a hundred bucks. So this one's uh, this narrow band filter will do it too. Uh, uh, the moon filter does the same thing only with more of a new, it's sort of a new, well, it is just a neutral. Yeah, it's density. neutral density. Yeah. So that will help. But these sky glow filters are, do a pretty good job of, um, getting rid of, getting rid of, uh, certain bands of, see this one, this one claims that filters blocks all forms of light pollution, allowing you to see fainter deep sky objects yeah. with wide band filters or unfiltered. So. Yeah, I mean, 80 bucks, it's worth the money, especially if you want to look at the Andromeda Galaxy and see more detail. It just gets rid of that glow, that that um, surrounding night sky background that you always see. What um, else is there? Moon filter? The moon filter, yeah. This just neutral density filter, which will basically tone down the glare from the moon so you can see it the yeah. detail on the moon better. Those are real cheap. It's, but those are it's pretty kind of uh, it's counterintuitive that... You, you need to tone down the uh, the glare from the moon to see it properly, but you do. Oh, I know. I've actually out. hurt my eyes looking mm. at the moon through a telescope. It's been that bad. Yeah, it's very bright. It's Especially extremely now. Bright. Yeah, right now it's almost full. Yeah. Um, yeah. You mainly need them and it's, um, so it's full. Yeah, really. yeah, really. Right, like right about now. These are kind of nice. These planetary imaging filters... Uh, they have UV filters and infrared filters, and they they are they're good for bringing out detail in the planetary atmospheres uh, of say uh, 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 Jupiter or um, or Saturn, and not Venus so much because you can't really see any detail anyway. But uh, but these these are real pricey. I would not recommend these. Although if you're really into uh, imaging the moon and or I'm sorry the planets, this is a good good thing to play with a little bit. And of course, solar filters, but we, we talked about those last time. So um, you can bring out different details, can't you, with different color filters? Yeah, right. Yeah. Like I was saying before, you can get like an oxygen filter. Excuse me. And you can get like an oxygen filter and uh, 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 filter out certain parts of, say, uh, Saturn, for example, things like that, and get some more detail out. Um, let's see. Take back space. It's easy to test LPR filters on the moon. Um, I would definitely attend an astronomy cruise. Can't wait already. I know those would be fun. Um, 
I want to get invited to do some talks on an astronomy cruise. I think that would be great. Um, Is that a free holiday, Tony? Yeah, I would like that. Yeah, uh, <laughs> LEDs are horrible for light pollution. You can't filter them out anymore. That's what we we're just saying. Yeah, that's that's true. Okay, guys, we're oh my gosh, we're past dude, we're past our time. Um, all right, I want to thank you all for why. I hope you're enjoying these hangouts. We will be back in two weeks. We don't know what we're talking about yet because I haven't asked these guys. Uh, but we're going to go more into uh, uh, telescopes and amateur astronomy. Tell us in the comments what you would like to see more of. If you've got any suggestions, we are open for it. Between the three of us, you've got a lot of experience here, folks. So make use of it. If you want to buy a telescope, then ask us. If you want to buy a certain model of telescope, let us know, and we'll tell you what we think of it. Um, and if you want to know about coatings, if you want to know about, you know, maybe we should do imaging. Um, we haven't really talked much about yeah. imaging and that's that, yeah that's like uh i i well, RSC's in the, um, into it only because... system, as if we could do that you want to do that okay yeah rsc's in the in the comments on okay YouTube. well good then we will go into imaging a bit next time it is a field that it is an area that's probably going to require more than one hangout uh, we'll talk about cameras, we'll talk about pixel scale, we'll talk about mac matching your camera to your telescope and why that's important. We'll talk about webcams. Webcams used to be a thing uh, on on uh, on, use, on telescopes as well. I've used them on those uh, many times. So we'll talk about all of that coming up next time, unless we decide to do something different. But for now, that's what we'll do. <laughs> all right, guys. Uh, Adam, John, thank you so much for taking time out to talk right, telescopes with us. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks, and we'll talk about imaging. So please leave comments in the description or in the comment section. Let us know what you'd like to see. And um, okay. Uh, all right. Well, and, and Tony. Yes. Yeah. Keep. Go ahead. Send us out. Thank you all for watching. Keep looking up. And as always, <laughs> keep, keep looking, up. looking up. That's right. Thank you, folks. You know, I had a different... What do you guys... I, you know, I actually have two taglines. One of them I took is keep looking up. But another one I also used was astronomy. Shake, or no, perspective. Shaken, not stirred. That's my other one. What do you think? <laughs> no? Very smooth. It's Very not, smooth. It's Tony. not as cool. Is it? Okay. Well, anyway, that's... All right, folks. Thank you all for watching. And as... You need a Marcini in your hand. Tony I do. Uh, that's yes. That's very true. It's, it's going to be that time, actually. All right, folks. <laughs> ah, John's already gotten started. He's got his logger. going. Oh, all right. <laughs> all right, folks. Thanks, guys. Talk to you guys later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.